will call the special meeting of City Council to order for Wednesday, September 29th. Um, today is a sp uh, special meeting for us to deal with uh, some further uh, follow-up in regards to permissive tax exemption. So our first delegations uh, this morning is item 2.1. Uh, we have the South Peace Community Resources Society. Angela and Barb are here. and. Uh, the delegation table is yours, Angela, welcome. Um, we set aside about 10 minutes for our delegations to give an overview of uh, your organization and then at the end of that we'll have some time available for council to ask any questions of you. So welcome, good morning, thanks for coming today. Good morning. Um, so my presentation is about 12 and a half minutes. Okay. I've been practicing for you, <laughs> uh, so hopefully that's okay. <laughs> the chair will extend some leeway. Thank you kindly, <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Okay, I'm good to go? Yep, okay. go ahead. Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to present to you today uh, to speak to the issue of the permissive tax exemption for South Peace Community Resources, or SPICRS, as we're more co commonly referred to. Um, so I'm going to start by just giving uh, just a brief statement about the agency generally, and then I will speak directly to the four properties that we have covered under the permissive tax exemption and the programming that we have offered there, okay? Uh, so Spickers has been serving the community for over 47 years. So we were first established in 1974 uh, with just two programs at that time. So we are very much a grassroots organization, homegrown here in Dawson Creek. Uh, we have grown since then to offer 27 programs across four communities in the Peace Liard region. We are a registered not-for-profit uh, society and currently employ about 120 staff. Uh, all of our services are 100% free of charge. Our agency serves a diverse range of service recipients, so we see uh, children, seniors, uh, persons with diverse abilities, uh, women and children fleeing violence, uh, individuals struggling with poverty issues and homelessness. We see all kinds of people coming through our doors. Um, and at Spickers, we envision a community where people are valued and accepted regardless of circumstance. So our mission is to ensure that individuals are provided with opportunities to develop in all dimensions. And we do this by providing responsive and personalized services that are compassionate, understanding, and supported by society while advocating for responsible social change. So I'm now gonna speak directly to uh, the, the properties that are covered under the exception. So I'm gonna start off by speaking about uh, 1018 to 1020 on 95th Avenue. So this is a fourplex. Uh, we call this our City View residence. And 1311, 106th Avenue, and we call this our Serenity House. So both of these properties are specialized housing services for persons with diverse abilities. So we are currently serving five clients between both of the locations, but we are licensed to support six and we're currently in the process of recruiting uh, a new client. Uh, so programs at both locations have 24-hour staffing to ensure that the clients are safe and supported at all times of the day. We are an accredited agency through the Council on Accreditation, and for those of you who don't know, basically it's like an international body that kind of governs and oversees social services agencies. And so whenever we have our site visits every four years, uh, the reviewers always remark about what a wonderful and welcoming uh, uh, program and facilities we have at both of these locations and say that this really feels like a home. And for us, as a service provider, it's certainly one of the highest compliments we can get because that's what we really strive for uh, with those programs in particular is we want our clients to feel like this is their home. Uh, both locations have a combination of communal and private space. So City View is a fourplex. So each of the clients have their individual units and then the yard is shared space. So they can have barbecues together and have some social time. Uh, Serenity is set up more like a traditional home, like a, a traditional residence. So uh, the clients have their private bedrooms and then the kitchen and living room space is, is shared accommodation and it works really well. Uh, we really try to prioritize client-centered care, which means that we want our clients to be able to act autonomously and make decisions about what they want to do in their life and in their day. So if we have something planned and the client indicates that they don't want to do that that day, we do our best uh, to respond to their needs in that moment. Uh, we strive to have the individuals we support uh, active in the community, so whether that's going out for lunch at one of our local restaurants, uh, going bowling, uh, swimming or skating at the rec centre, or just going for a walk in one of our beautiful parks. We really do everything we can to make sure that they're engaged and part of this community. Uh, one of our clients is even a uh, gold medal winner with the Special Olympics, so we're pretty proud of them. It's pretty, pretty incredible. 
Uh, our clients also engage in volunteer activities at the Salvation Army, at Networks Ministries, uh, and through our Better at Home program, doing friendly visitations and shopping trips and things like that with our local seniors. I always make the joke that our the clients we support in this program have a way better social life than I do. Uh, they're always out doing something amazing, which is super wonderful. Uh, so the next property I'm going to discuss is 904 103rd Avenue. Uh, so this building was previously the home for our Reconnect Youth program. We did make the difficult decision uh, not to renew this program contract in June of this year. So our own agency growth has put us in a position to evaluate all of the programs under our umbrella and clarify what's the best fit for us and what do we have the capacity for. Um, so we believe that there are other organizations in the community who have more of a youth focus and a greater capacity to support the program more fully. So I know Jana was in here a couple weeks ago making a wonderful presentation about all the great things they're doing at Nowakin. They've really expanded their youth programming. Uh, Haven Family Services is another one that's really expanded their offerings for this particular demographic, which is wonderful for our community. Uh, the space had previously been used by other agencies uh, in the community. We had boys and girls groups running out of that site, uh, and we had also previously partnered with the YMCA and Haven Family Services uh, to offer youth mindfulness training, and we are going to absolutely make this space uh, continue to be available uh, to the, our partner agencies as it is needed. Um, but having the space available does provide speakers with a unique and much needed opportunity uh, to expand our group counseling, group activities, life skills training, um, and also use the additional office space available at this work site. Uh, so in the past, when we have hosted this type of group activity, we've had to rent a space to do it, and obviously we won't have to. Uh, the, the house has like a wonderful little kitchen and a really cute little welcoming living room and a nice big kitchen table, which is ideal for the type of group work that we'd like to offer. Uh, obviously, our plans to host these events have been delayed a little bit due to the pandemic restrictions, but we are planning to get them up and rolling soon, as soon as we are able. Um, so in terms of some of the specific planning or sort of programs we're planning to offer, as we, you may know, um, we do run the Better at Home program for seniors and we've recently expanded our offerings for seniors to include uh, the Square One program. So Square One is a social prescribing program uh, where staff work to keep seniors connected and actively engaged in the community because you know, it's really important to make sure that when we're talking about health and well-being, it's not just your physical health, it's also your emotional and your mental health too. So it's a really important program for our community. So as part of that, uh, we're planning to host seniors baking and crafting events, um, little tea luncheon socials, and uh, hopefully some specialized programming for senior men uh, who we know can be acutely vulnerable to issues of depression and isolation as they age. Uh, we would also like to begin offering life skills training, crafting, and other social activities for women staying at our MISBA transition house, uh, and also our second stage housing, which is another program that we recently acquired for women and children who are fleeing violence, uh, and any other of, of our program clients where it would be a, a suitable referral, they would be welcome to join those types of activities as well. And also group counseling through our SDV program would be, would be a great fit. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, this building also has office space uh, available, which we have used in the past as overflow for our administrative office. Um, and we are now uh, potentially looking to permanently rehome some of the programming there as we continue to grow and run out of room at our administrative office, which is the next site that I'll be discussing. Uh, so uh, 10110 13th Street, uh, which is our McPhail Hutchinson administrative office, so our right next door. So this is our, ad main, our main admin building and it also hosts seven other programs, which is the largest number of programs that we have hosted at one work site. So I'm going to just briefly discuss the programs. So we have our legal advocate program, uh, which provides access to justice for all individuals facing poverty law issues by providing information, advocacy and referrals. We have our community-based victim services program, which provides crucial emotional support, information referrals, safety planning, preparation and accompaniment to court or the RCMP for survivors of childhood abuse, sexual assault, intimate partner violence, and violence against children and youth. Uh, we also have our homelessness intervention and prevention program, which we call our HIP program. And this program is a targeted service for eligible clients who need assistance to maintain housing. Uh, so the staff are able to provide um, a, a rental supplement or other types of financial support to do things like pay for a utility bill or even a, like a food st a stipend so that they can, you know, maybe they have money to pay their rent, but they, they don't have any money left over to pay for groceries, right? So we would offer support with that. 
Uh, we have a family support counselling program, which is designed to provide support to families so they can enhance their relationships and more effectively respond to crises as they uh, arise within the family unit. So if, if there's been a death and the family needs support to process their grief, um, or if there's issues around parental separation or divorce, the counsellor um, can offer support with some conflict resolution and effective communication skills building. We have a Stopping the Violence Women's Counseling Program. Uh, so this program provides therapeutic counseling for female uh, survivors of childhood abuse, sexual assault, intimate partner violence through individual and group counseling sessions. We have our outreach services uh, and they respond to the needs of women and their dependent children who have experienced or are at risk of violence. Uh, they provide women with short-term supportive counseling so it's very much a crisis-based response. Uh, there's safety planning, information and referrals, accompaniment and at times they can provide transportation to other services in the community if needed. Uh, we also recently required a grant to create sexual assault protocols in our community and expand our emergency response to sexual assault, which speaks to the issue of capacity that I previously mentioned, and that we're always look to, looking to expand our programming to better respond to the needs of our communities. And we are experiencing an increase in, in incidents of sexual assault in Dawson Creek right now. And uh, the ability to provide an effective community coordinated response is crucial uh, in reducing re-victimization and also to providing effective wraparound uh, service for the individual who has been impacted. But I guess really the key question here is what does having the permissive tax exemption on these properties allow speakers to do? So in short, it allows us to continue to expand and respond to the changing needs of our community. And most importantly, it allows us to continue to do the essential work that we are currently doing. The work of helping clients with diverse abilities get 24 hour support in a welcoming home environment the work of helping the woman who's living in her car find a safe place to stay and connect with other resources through our outreach program, the work of helping the person who is on the brink of homelessness stay housed and fed through our HIP program, the work of helping the woman process the trauma of her historical abuse through our Stopping the Violence Women Counseling Program, the work of helping the child testify against their abuser in court through the support of our Community-Based Victim Services Program. The work that we do at Spickers is essential and in many cases offers life-changing and life-saving support. And I thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Councilors, for providing us with this permissive tax exemption so that we can continue to do this work, this work that supports so many vulnerable people in our community. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Angela. And so um, to Council, questions. Councilor Dober. No, it's, uh, I'm oh, thank you, Worship. <laughs> uh, thanks, Angela, for the presentation. It was uh, great and awesome to see what you guys do in the community, and uh, uh, it's a huge part of our community, so thank you. Um, I just had one question, just on the uh, properties where there's, um, like, housing units. Yes. Are, like, are the clients, do they pay rent? Yeah, it's, uh, they do pay uh, rent, and then it's put uh, directly back into their program. Okay. So it's not, uh, like, a social enterprisey type situation they pay the rent and then it, it's deposited back in our program i'm looking at bar because she's my numbers lady she's <laughs> our finance administrator at the agency okay so. and then the transition house for example like the, like ladies and uh, people that use that facility they wouldn't pay rent right? like no so that and that building is owned by bc housing as well we don't own that property but oh, yeah okay. so the women that come there they just come there as needed and it's a short-term stay generally up to 30 days and then we also have the second stage housing now that i had mentioned which is also for women and uh, children fleeing abuse and that's a bit of a longer term stay so up to you know 18 months uh, type of situation until they can move to a, another stable situation but it, and that that program there is uh, a rent paid but again it's a bc housing owns yeah. those buildings okay, so the clients that are using the facilities and um are paying rent like they wouldn't be able to go out on their own and rent off somebody else oh, right? no yeah. no okay they require 24-hour support yeah. like yeah okay perfect thank yeah. you very much yeah Councilor so those two uh Houses 1311 and 1018, mm -hmm. they're both uh, have support, like staff there 24, 24 hours a day? 24 hours a day, yes. So, and there's no fee for those uh, people that are living there? 
Um, no, it's so that it's sort of like a program contract that we have through uh, CLBC, uh, Community Living BC, um, to to support these clients. So it's part of the funding that we pay our staff, and they're housed and supported and fed, and all of their needs are met through the through the program contract. Okay. Um, the house on 904, 904 103rd, is that for sale? No. So you, all those plans that you've got for it, it's just vacant now? Yeah, the program ended uh, at the end of June, and so we had to sort of clear everything out, and then our plan is, again, we're talking about permanently rehoming uh, some of our uh, programs from our, from our administrative office there and running group uh, group program. Bru as you can tell, I'm, I'm just like, I need my coffee this morning, right? I'm running group programming out of that location because we are busting at the seams next door. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, anything further, Council? Um, thank you, Angela, and uh, for coming in this morning. I, I think one of the real benefits to, certainly to me, uh, when we've had these presentations from a community organization such as yourself, um, just how, how informative it's been for us to get uh, the detail and the overview of programs and services that are being provided to our community in so many ways and mm -hmm. and uh, to me I think we take for granted sometimes speakers that's been here forever but you know employing 120 people and providing all of these services and programs into our community is just unbelievable and uh, and that stuff that um, I think is so valuable to community. So we appreciate you coming in this morning and giving us an overview of uh, South Peace Community Resources Society. Yeah, thank absolutely, you. and thank you so much thank for your time. You. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, delegation uh, this morning, item 2.2, .2, is the BC Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. We have Wendy in attendance and uh, Wendy's here representing the, uh, of course, the SPCA. Wendy, welcome. Welcome, Wendy. It's uh, nice to see you uh, today. It's been a while, so uh, it's yeah. good to have you here. And uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes allocated to each um, right. or organization to give a bit of an overview for council in terms of uh, the uh, operations of the uh, particular organization. And um, and then uh, council will have opportunity to ask any questions they may have at the Perfect. end of your presentation. So welcome. Uh, it's good to have you here. And yeah. you're welcome to take the mask off if you like because you are. Okay. Perfect. Perfect, yes. So, uh, well, no worries. We have to sanitize the whole shelter between every per person coming through, so <laughs> I get this whole thing. Oh, my goodness, it's so good to see everybody. Uh, your Worship Council, it's been a really long time since I was able to come down here. <laughs> I used to spend a lot of time in the gallery down here uh, watching council meetings, so it's lovely to see everybody. I think that's one of the greatest challenges we've faced over the last uh, couple of years is that lack of personal contact, like, you know, being able to get out and see everybody. Um, so, I think... I think this might be the first time I've done this in the 12 years. Maybe I've done it once before, I'm not sure, in the 12 years that I've been with the organization. Um, I will definitely be able to answer any question you guys might have about what we do because I've been there a really long time. Um, the uh, BCSBC obviously uh, runs the local animal shelter. We provide care for animals in need um, as well as community members that are you know, having challenges. Um, we support other organizations like uh, we work with Network Ministries with our Animal Food Bank as well as the Nowakan Friendship Center. We provide um, food for, for people in need. Our local veterinarians um, also keep in close contact with us when they have, say, a client that comes in that may take really good care of their animal but can't quite meet the needs that are, are being provided. So, you know, on case-to-case -case basis, we're there to support um, our community. Uh, we also have finally opened up our volunteer program again uh, after all of the COVID restrictions. I am like so excited to see the people back in, uh, families coming in. Uh, it's so important for children to be able to come in and learn about empathy, compassion for others, um, the skills 
that are developed by spending time with animals. Um, the other thing that's really kind of come up lately for me that uh, has been really special to my heart is that um, we've had some senior um, members of the community who have been really locked in for the last uh, year and a half, two years, and they've been able to come out um, and spend time with animals. And it's really, uh, like we have, have some really committed ones now that um, they really express to us how, how that makes a real difference in their day and their feeling of connection with the community. So those are, those are some of the things that um, are special to me that we do um, in the community. And somehow I've lost my notes. Sorry about that. Um, we do have two facilities right now in the, uh, in the city. We have had, because um, everyone knows we've uh, completed the, the construction of our new facility that we're now <laughs> happily running out of. It's, uh, it's uh, really rags to riches. I mean, there's been a few bumps along the road, of course, like any new building, um, but uh, we've come a long way. Um, the, the services we've provided really haven't changed through COVID. Um, there's been a lot of restrictions having um, the type of people or the number of people we can come in. We have to do everything by appointment now. Like I said, we have to sanitize between people coming through. One of the things that I've noted um, over the last year is the increase in uh, cruelty investigations. Um, that we've received. Um, we have actually seen, I, I'm not sure if it's more people at home and more people reporting, or if it's, um, you know, people struggling more. I'm not sure uh, what the cause of it is. Um, but you can certainly see in our, in our medical budget um, that, you know, we, we really increased uh, the amount of money spent between 19, 2019 and 2020. Um, and that has continued into this year. Uh, as far as the, the number of animals coming to care that require extensive care, extensive needs. And again, that's where our volunteers and our community members being able to come in and support are so valuable to us. Um, those animals often need a lot of extra care um, and uh, it's very um, enriching for the humans that get to be involved with that and provide that care as well. Um, Yeah, I think I've covered most of that. Oh, the other thing, so um, the other thing that a lot of people don't know about our organization um, is the our emergency board program. Now we do work with the Mitzpah uh, house in, in uh, our community to make sure that if um, a person is escaping um, a challenging situation in their life and they have pets that they don't need to lose their pets on top of everything else that's challenging in their life. We provide vaccinations and often medical care for those animals while they're in our care. Um, there is no financial commitment from the, from the person needing help. Uh, we do cover that, um, you know, of course, everything we can within our budget as well, but that's something we offer to the community. Um, and that also extends to people that may be hospitalized or people who are in a, in a car accident um, that have emergency need for their animals. Um, and so that's a really special program as well. Uh, we also supply um, food bank for some First Nation communities around the South Peace region. So we actually deliver food uh, bank out to those regions as well. Um, so we have officers, our, um, not our local office, like not the animal control officers, but our cruelty officers actually go out to site, and sometimes staff do if they're out in the regions, and go to, uh, to bring out food, and, and we keep, keep in contact with them that way as well. So, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Wendy. Um, questions from Council? Councilor Dweckoff. The Your old site, 637 114th? Yes. That's up for sale? Yes. You haven't had any offers? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah. Who, who handles the sale? Uh, Arlene Delosky. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Anything further, Council? Councillor Dober? Mm. Thanks for the presentation. Yeah, Wendy. no problem. Good to see everyone. Um, the property, the, the older building, yeah. it's for sale, obviously, but are you guys doing anything out of it right now, or is it just empty? It's just empty. It's, yeah. Well, it's got some storage kennels, things like that in it, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, so f thank you, Wendy. It's yeah. uh, obviously it's good to see you. Uh, it's been a while, as you said, and uh, so as always, it's really uh, appreciated the uh, opportunity to have organizations in the community providing services, and obviously the partnership with the SPCA for us and okay. all of the work you do, we uh, certainly appreciate. It and uh, thank you for coming in this morning. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. really great to see everyone. Thanks, Wendy. Hug a dog. <laughs> yes. What about a cat? <laughs> what? What about a cat? Yeah, yeah I can hug They're a cat. They, they scratch you when you hug them. Um, <laughs> just uh, on an exiting point, you know, um, since the cat bylaws have come into play, I just ran some stats in the, in the years following, the four years before uh, cat bylaws, we had approximately 9% of cats returned to the owner in the city of Dawson Creek. It's, it's uh, averaged around 33% since. Um, I mean, we're not where we want to be. Like, dogs sit around 68 to 70% return to owner, but we're, we're sure well on our way. So. Uh, what a great success that has great been. Great job. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week. Yes, you as well. Quick question. Yes. Um, do you guys have the gallery open for like normal council meetings now? Yep. Like, is that something that yep. happens again? Awesome. All We're right. doing our best. <laughs> okay. See you guys later. See you, Wendy. Okay. Okay. We'll take a five minute recess. We're ourselves back to order and um, we're back on to our agenda item uh, 2.3. And we have the Dawson Creek Society for Community Living uh, in attendance. And uh, we'll be giving us a presentation on overview of um, their uh, operations and facilities. And so we have Marla. Reed and Kirsten Homie are here to give us an update. Welcome to come on in, Marla. So we have uh, item 2.4 is the Dawson Creek Society for Community Living. And uh, this morning joining us, we have Marla Reed and Kirsten Homie here representing the um, Society for Community Living. Welcome. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm just gonna, if you can just pop that mic on the button on it. Have a chair, Marla, honestly. And um, so we've got about 10 minutes set aside for each organization to give a bit of an update overview of uh, your uh, operation and the um, uh, properties that have been identified, Marla. And then at the end of it, we'll have an opportunity at your presentation uh, for council to ask any questions they may have. So uh, we appreciate you guys coming this morning to give us an update on the Society for Community Living and the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us today. And you can take the mask off oh, if you're more comfortable. Because uh, it's hard to breathe with masks yeah. and glasses. I don't know. They don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought today um, to thank you for inviting me to come and talk. I don't get the chance to talk about inclusion and accessibility very often, and it's a passion of mine. So I'm going to give you guys a history lesson. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so um, I think we're two years younger than the city. We're uh, incorporated in 1958, so we're 63 years old this year. And many people don't know that uh, we've been around that long. We're one of the oldest community living societies in the province. <clears throat> so in 1958, we had a group of family members in Dawson Creek who their children weren't allowed to go to the regular school. They just weren't, if you had a disability in Dawson Creek or anywhere in the province, you couldn't go to school. So we had a group of families who said, well, this isn't on, we're not doing that. Dawson Creek being the radical families that they are. And so they incorporated this society. And what they did is they had school in the basement of the Alliance Church. And they created their own cur curriculum, did their own fundraising, and they advocated for the kids to be in the school. And they did that for a couple years. In 1961, we got the school board on, on side and they built the Open Door School. Does anybody remember the Open Door School? Yeah, sure. That was us. And so that's up at Crescent Park. And so at that point, our children in this community with disabilities were part of the school system, but not welcomed in the school system. And so they went to that school until 1982, when the government finally got on board with the idea that our people with disabilities belonged in our communities. They belonged in, in homes and in our schools. 
And so that's really the start of the society, when it really took off. So when they closed the institutions, which many people we support came from, they looked around the province and they said, where did these people come from? And many of the communities that came from had no, had no services. We were lucky people, the only ones in the north, in Dawson Creek, that had services. So anybody Prince George North, when they were um, discharged from the institutions, came to Dawson Creek. And so that's really the start of, of where we came. And in the early 80s, we had a couple group homes, we had the place on 17th Street, we did recycling. You guys probably remember all of these history pieces. And so we've just really supported people with disabilities since 1958. In the mid-90s, we recognized that people with disabilities living in our community were not living in good housing. Housing was expensive and they were living in slums, and so the executive director at the time started the society down the housing path. And so in 2000, we opened our first housing, and we now, to this day, have Northview, Southview, Aurora Townhouses, Aurora Apartments, Rotary Village, and three licensed facilities. And so we now own and operate 130 units of housing for low-income people with disabilities, low-income families, and seniors. So that's one service stream. We've also totally expanded our community living um, service stream over the last 40 years. And we do things like uh, supported employment. We have a social enterprise, which you guys are well aware of, our confidential shredding. We employ nine people with disabilities, um, fully funded by the, by the service that we have, fully paid for by them. They receive at least min minimum wage, if not more. Um, we have community inclusion programs. We have licensed facilities. Our, our latest licensed facility was built in 2017. And the reason it was built is because people with disabilities, again, are not welcome in the long-term care system. And these people that are living in their home right now are some of the original people back to 1958. And so we built a, a dementia home just down on 117th Street. And that's called, we're not very creative with our names, but it's called 1416 Residence. And it's an it's a aging home um, for adults with developmental disabilities. And, and two of the residents are our original clients, which is pretty cool. So today I shared with you our performance improvement report just to tell you a little bit about what we did over the last year. Over the last year, we, we uh, provided 158,000 hours of service to adults with developmental disabilities, seniors and families in the community of Dawson Creek. We also, um, in the midst of all this crazy COVID-ness, um, were able to get some grants from United Way and we started a meal call program for seniors living in the community and living in our supported, in our housing. And we delivered over 5,200 meals last year to seniors um, in the community. In addition to that, we had many seniors who were terrified of going out because of COVID. And I think they did over 550 grocery shops for seniors um, just to keep them safe in their home. Just, we didn't get funded for it, we just did it because that's what we do. So today, we have 130 staff. We have 130 units of housing. And last year we provided service to 100, 260 individuals in the community. That's just individuals. And if you think about if each person has one person attached to them, that's 1,500 people in this community that we supported. Our Opportunity Center alone um, is, where, is where individuals, it's a drop-in center where we teach recreational, educational, social, and employment skills, had over 5,000 activities last year just through COVID. And it's a drop-in center open to anybody in the community. So kind of bounced around a bit, but we've been around a long time. We do a lot of things and I could talk forever, so I won't. So if you have questions, um, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Marla. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, questions for Council? Councillor Jovekov. So uh, we just had a presentation from Spickers as well and they house uh, people with disabilities. Is there a coordinated approach, or how does that work between your organization and Spickers? Okay, so we are an independent, nonprofit, charitable organization, and so is Spickers. And so, Community Living is a is a funder of people with disabilities in the province, and we bid on contracts. So, in, we have 
a significant number of, of contracts, and Spickers has a, has a contract with Community Living BC as well. So anybody can become a contractor to Community Living BC. It's just something that we as a society have specialized in, and our mandate is people with disabilities and seniors. So we just kind of stay within that scope, but other organizations might be multifaceted, multi-service. <coughs> That's why. So those contracts come open from the provincial government? At Crown Corporation, and once they're awarded, they're, they stay there unless there's a reason to give them up or, or, the, or they take them away. But typically, once you get a contract, you, you have it. We've had some contracts since 1988. Are there uh, private suppliers as well that yep. bid on those? Yeah, it's, it's an open bid process. I mean, you have to become a pre-qualified. You have to actually apply to become uh, a supplier of CLBC, and you have to go through a pre-qualification process. So when you uh, bid on them, is there provisions to pay uh, property taxes? No, I can I can negotiate for it. But so what we do what we do is we're not asking for uh, forgiveness for property taxes for all of our properties. We're only asking for forgiveness of property taxes for properties that we own outright. As an example, we own Southview up on the hill. So we own Southview, but we have an operating grant with BC Housing and. In the, as part of the operating grant, they give us taxes, so we don't ask for, we don't ask the city for provision for to forgive that because BC Housing will pay that. Our opportunities, our admin center, our admin building, as an example, we don't have funding for that. Administration is funded by all of our other contracts, so that is one building that we apply to the city for for tax relief because it comes. We have to find the money, and the more money that we can give back to the community and get in people's hands and help them, that's where we focus on. So that's a savings that we can pass on to others. So we have six prop. We have lots of properties. Um, we have six properties that we've asked for an exemption on, and they all are properties that we own outright or have a situation where it, we don't get the money from somebody else. So Rotary Village, um, <coughs> Yeah, that is it a, a contract type thing as well, or? Rotary Village is the one anomaly. We inherited it. Rotary Village, the Rotary Club, I think it was in 58 too, late 50s, uh, worked with BC Housing and created Rotary Village. And in 2000, and, I'm gonna date myself here, um, mid 2000s, uh, the Rotary Club came to us and they, they wanted to give us the Rotary Village because the board was aging and they, you know, they recognized what we were doing and. Anyway, they wanted to give it to us. So we went through a process of, of transferring that building to the Dawson Creek Society because we're charitable. And so we inherited kind of what they did. And originally what the Rotary Har um, Harbor Society, or Rotary Harbor? I think that's what they were called. Um, they, they had applied. And so it was just something that we just kept rolling along. And it's not included in the BC Housing Operating Agreement for that building because that's how the Rotary Club had negotiated it to begin with? Yeah, so it's not included in our funding. So uh, the, um, I think it's the assessment said there's 18 units in there? There's 30. Or 34 units. There's 30. 30 units, all subsidized. 30, 30 units. 30 units. 30? Yeah. And um, those people pay rent. Mm -hmm. And what are their rents? What's the... Each the, building... Uh, each building we have with um, BC Housing, there's a, an operating agreement, and most of them are called what's called rent geared to income. And so there's a formula that BC Housing uses where we, every year, um, we have to get people's, uh, they have to proof of income, and then they pay a percentage of their rent to us, and then BC Housing subsidizes the difference. So as an example, rent geared to income for somebody on a disability pension would be their rent for a one bedroom would be $320. And then BC, they pay that to us, and then BC Housing pays us the difference. So what, what would the total be, including BC Housing? For each unit, it's different across the entire agency, depending on what building you're in, the size of the unit, whether it's one bedroom, two bedroom, all sorts of things. Well, for example, for Rotary Village for a one bedroom, I believe it's 707. 707? That's why she's here. She's the money. <laughs> and uh, there's larger suites, I guess. Does it go up to three bedroom or? No. No, they're all one bedroom. Um, actually, at Rotary, it's interesting because back in the, when it was built, uh, bachelor suites were the thing of the day. <laughs> and bachelor suites aren't very um, desirable. So um, over the years that we've been slowly kind of making, as they've become, two become available, we've been making them kind of one, 
large bedroom, but they're all one bedrooms. Mm -hmm. All of our apartment buildings are one bedrooms, um, except for Southview has one two bedroom. And then our townhouses, we have uh, eight two bedrooms and four and, and two four bedrooms. But everybody else, everything else is one bedroom. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councillor Dover. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, thank you for your presentation. Just a question about um, the rentals, uh, the clients that you rent to. Like, do you have staff on, like, in those homes to like assist them, or are they able? Some of them able to live on their own, or is it? Our mission statement is to support people to, spend, to live an independent and dignified life. So every situation is unique. Yeah. So as an example, um, you know that we own Northview. Northview is funded by the Northern Health Authority, and we have a contract to provide staffing in that building. Southview is a senior's apartment building. There's no staffing in there because the seniors are independent, but we do um, our seniors meal program in there. So each program is different. We have people with disabilities who live in various things and they have Community Living BC has, we have a contract to support them in their housing. So yes okay. and no. Depends on where you are and um, where you're at in life and what your need is. And you would have like, um like outline qualifications, what people would need to qualify to stay in, in your Oh, sure, housing? yeah, it's all referral based, like for our community living services. Um, we're at, we contract directly with CLBC so that they, they refer individuals to us. Okay. Or we bid on a contract specifically to a certain service. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for what you do in the community too. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dover. Anything else, Council? If I could, Your Worship. Yes, go ahead, Councillor Wilbur. My little, and now I don't know how to take my little hand down that I put up. <laughs> um, one, Marla, thank you for coming to council and giving us some history because I know some of us on council weren't aware of all that information, so I appreciate it. So I also wanted to clarify that other than the parcels that you're asking for exemption on, you are actually paying taxes on all of those other properties Correct. that you own. Yes. So do you roughly know what the amount is that you pay for taxes on all of those other buildings? Rough whole number? I didn't pull that information. Um, it would be in the financials that I think I sent in with the applications. Perfect, okay, I'll look at that. I know, I know it's a sizable amount and that's the point I'm trying to make. But I also wanna make the point um, to my colleagues and to those watching that if it wasn't for this organization, that our most vulnerable people in our community would not be included, they would not have safety, and they would not have reliability in their lives. So thank you for the service, thank you for believing in it, and thank you for growing, because I know what you do, and I know some of the clients that you have, and without this type of service, which many communities do not have, the issues we're dealing with today would be much larger. And so I really want to stress that point to my colleagues and to those watching. So without having any other words, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think the mayor is even in thank our report you. on page 17. <laughs> There's a that. picture of you in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not getting, I'm not getting housing assistance, am I? <laughs> no, but your buddies with what somebody we support. <laughs> uh, There's so many great, great people that you guys provide support to in our community, and it's always just a thrill for me to see the work that you guys have done. Thank and you. I, I said to um, Angela from Speakers just earlier, it's uh, these these presentations have been so informative to us. I think as Councillor Wilbur has indicated, to be able to get an understanding of 130 people employed by Dawson Creek Society of Community Living, 120 by Speakers employed, and so the, the, the services that are being provided to our community and the widespread reach that's going on in our community to me is just unbelievable and it's organizations like you guys that have been around for a very, very long time providing that and supporting that. And, so we just really appreciate the time that you guys have taken to be able to do that for us today. And, and thank you for coming in. It's, yeah. uh, it was really informative and we appreciate it. Awesome. And the work you guys do. Obviously. Thank you very much. And again, I, I cut it short. I could have talked forever. I have some great stories. <laughs> That's why we give 10 but, minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the coffee's always on and the door's always open. And if you ever want to wander down the street and have a tour and actually get to see it, um, it, it is much more impactful. And you're very welcome to come at any point in time. We'd love to have you. Thank you, Marla. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, Kristen. Thank it's you. nice to see you. I'll shut that. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Very good. Very good. Is this televised? What's that? Is yeah. This yeah. For closed? What's that? For it's closed? Uh, this open. Oh, okay. Yeah. So now, sorry, I got to get my... Sorry. Our next uh, item 2.4 is just a um, from Grandview Chapel in regards to the vacant lot, and uh, we received a letter from uh, Pastor Vigor, and so we don't need to do anything other than receive it, Brenda. And do we need a motion at this point to receive it? Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Second, Councillor Dover. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Um, we now that ends our um, presentations, delegations this morning. Um, our next item, item three, is correspondence. 3.1, we have a letter from Connie Patterson, president of the Dawson Creek Exhibition Association, and they're looking and have made a request for a letter of support from us for uh, application they want to make to the BC Fairs, Festivals and Events uh, Recovery Fund Grant uh, Program. Councillor Dober? I'll make a mo motion to, uh, uh, to send a letter in support of uh, the grant application. Thank you. Second, Councillor Kemp, discussion. Councillor Dover, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. I uh, just curious, does that like them applying for this grant? Does it affect the city in any way, or any grants that we're applying for? Through you, Your Worship, no, it doesn't. This is one that was put forward. It's, uh, I believe, to do with the COVID relief program the government has put forward, and this is for fairs and festivals. So. Thank all you. Right. Good. Thanks, Blair. Uh, mm -hmm. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. We'll now go to reports for uh, 4.1. We have a verbal report from Flavia in regards to our permissive tax exemptions. Good morning, Flavia. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so mainly now, uh, like we did in the last meeting, uh, we will take in consideration the decision that council will have about deny or accept those applications. And then the idea is that by uh, this agenda for next Monday, we will then present the, the first three readings of the bylaw as the result of those uh, decisions. And that's... Thank you. Um, this, honestly, I, I, said it, I think it's been extremely worthwhile in my view to get uh, updates and information on these community organizations that are submissions in our community and providing services on uh, behalf of so many. Uh, thank you, Flavia. Uh, any of the um, these properties today that were submitted for the permissive tax exemption, were any of them, like, were they all receiving this before, the new? Yes, Your Worship, all those properties are uh, previously uh, uh, granted the permissive tax exemption. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now, um, Brenda, we have um, under mayor's business, we will deal with each of those uh, items as uh, presented today from the delegations. And um, we have a memo from the corporate officer um, that we will either approve the application for permissive tax exemption for the organization or that the application for permissive tax exemption for the organization be denied. And we'll go through each of them as we did in the last meeting so that council then can uh, make their decision uh, based on today's information on those four organizations. And so our first item uh, was the f item 5.2, delegation number one was the South Peace Community Resources Society. And they had those uh, five, four properties. So, Councillor Dover. I'll make a motion to accept the application from South Peace Community Resource Society for all four uh, properties. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Dvekov. Discussion? You ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? Uh, it's carried. <laughs> a little delay there, so... <laughs> um, that's good. Item number uh, 5.3, we have delegation from the uh, request from the BC Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and this deals with their old location on 114th Avenue. Councillor Dover. 
Oh, that's still on. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the application from the BC Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals for the permissive tax exemption. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? So what was the, what was it? For the SPCA. The motion? Approve. Approve. Approve the, the Approve the application for both properties. Approve the exemption, yeah. This is SPCA? Yeah. Yeah. Just one property in the way? Both. I'll we'll second that motion, Your Worship. The, uh, the only one. So we're doing both properties? I think they only applied for. Your Worship, on this, the only request we have is for their empty uh, building. So I'm not sure if they have made a mistake and not put forward their. So council has made the motion for both properties? But we don't have a request for their first property. There's only one request, which is for their empty building. Is that something I can make? Can we clarify? With that, or how does that? I will ask. Uh, Go ahead, Clavia. Uh, through your ship, there are two uh, properties, but the request here to review for this motion is only for this empty uh, property. O under this uh, presentation today, it was requested to present only for this, this portion that they are not uh, operating anymore. Did they pay for? No. Like, did they apply for this when they were in the old building? They did apply for both the old and the new. But they, for this request here that when council requested us to bring them for a delegation, it was f only for this portion of the empty. Oh, so they've already applied for the new? Yes, they okay. did. Sorry. Okay, so then for the like, old property. Yes, yeah, so the way we have <laughs> approached these delegations is at the request of council. Um, and when council requested the SPCA to come, the issue was their vacant building. It yes. wasn't the right. existing okay. SPCA yeah. facility, the new one they're in. So they presented. The other one, uh, the approach we've taken as council thus far, is that they are automatically yeah. on the list. Because yeah. we didn't and request we'll everybody come exactly. to us on Correct. all of the other properties that aren't. There was just the request for this property, and council needs to approve just for this property. The other one is included in our permissive right? tax yes. exemption. Yes. So, so the motion will be that we approve the request for 630 okay. And uh, the seconder for that was Councillor Wilbur. Are you okay with that, Councillor Wilbur? Yes. Thank you. Discussion? Councillor Jovekov? So, like I brought this forward, I thought it was pretty clear there. There was just the one request. That's for the vacant property. Yeah. The old site. Yeah. And they're, they've listed it up for sale. So I don't see any point in extending the exemption like it doesn't make any sense to me um so i will obviously be voting against the motion <laughs> thank you it's a, a property that will be disposed of it could be sold tomorrow uh, who knows but to carry the tax exemption for 2022 does not make sense to me thank you councillor dover uh the Thank you, Worship. Uh, the permis the tax exemption, is it attached to the the land itself or to the BCSPCA? Like if that land sells tomorrow to a business, how how does that work? Because they would obviously wouldn't qualify for the permissive tax exemption. Sir so, Worship, the permissive tax exemption is through the property. So what happens like either if they sell it but it uh, is after the deadline of October 31st that you'll be considered exempted for next year, the that property. That's how BC assessment works. So everything we provide <coughs> by October 31st, if you're saying that the council is granting that property an exemption, so they will consider 100% or whatever percentage of exemptions for that assessed value. Let's say, and what happened with network ministry, they bought after October 31st, so whatever was set at that time by BC assessment, exempted or not, that's what's going to apply for next year. 
So independent if we, you are granting now, and let's say tomorrow they sell for a third part, a profit organization, that property until the end of 2022 is considered exempted. Okay, well, I, like, just to talk about that, like, obviously it doesn't make sense that somebody buys it and they would be tax exempt, but the reality is, is that property's been empty for a long time. There's not much cost to the city to have it sit empty. The water, the sewer's not running. Um, I would still vote in favor of exempting them. If we charge them taxes on that, that's going to take away from what they do in their existing building and organization. So I'm going to vote in favor of the motion still. Thank you. Councillor Dvekov? Uh, <clears throat> I believe the taxes were something like uh, 400 and some dollars. And it isn't very much to the city in the big picture, but it is shared by all of the taxpayers. And, uh, you know, I, I think our role here is to represent the taxpayers. And I think uh, the permissive tax on that is uh, unwarranted. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Councillor Earl? I, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so I, I just one or two things uh, to Flavia's point. So the issue networks got in, they were exempt because initially it was owned by the school district and then it was sold. And once they took possession, they weren't exempted for the year. I thought that was the whole point behind us doing that. So if this goes from being owned by a nonprofit to say it's bought by a private business, you're telling me that tax exemption would remain for the year? We, we grant a tra tax exemption status to the BCSPCA for that property in that location. Okay. A school is automatically exempted, and that would be the okay. difference. I by legislation, it. a school is exempted by legislation, and so the new mm -hmm. owner is automatically, in this case, networks would automatically become a taxable property because they don't qualify mm -hmm. either as a school then, uh, counselor, and we need to then extend the tax exemption uh, to it through our policy. Okay, um, okay, and, and speaking to the motion, um, I, I mean, so if, if we, we provide them with the exemption and they sell the property before the end of October, uh, or we don't provide them with the exemption, pardon me, and they sell the property with you before the end of October, uh, it's a moot point either way uh, because they're not paid. But if we don't and it takes a little longer to sell the property, they're up to 500 bucks. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with supporting Councillor Dover's motion for no other reason than it's not as though they're sitting on the property and, and it's um, like with some, some of the other properties we've looked at where it was basically just being held in limbo. Um, they are actively trying to sell it. Uh, and once it's sold, it will uh, presumably, because it's in a commercial area, find its way back into the tax base. So I'm fine with, uh, I'm fine with the motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? I also am in favor of it. I think to me, uh, four or five hundred dollars just means we take away uh, from other services and or we pay them one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year to provide uh, services to the community for our animal control. And that's all funding that would then be impacted to me in terms of how and what we do with the Society for uh, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So I'm, I'm good with it. And hopefully next year it's sold and we would then deal with it at that point. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Councillor Javekov, opposed? Uh, 5.4, we have delegation number three, the Dawson Creek Society for Community Living. Councillor Javekov? Um, I make a motion to deny the uh, application for uh, Rotary Village, which is uh, 107-17-13th Street. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that motion? Councillor Kemp? Discussion? Councillor Javeka? So this is uh, another example of basically an apartment similar to Bethel Apartments and um, the other one that we denied, I forget what it was last week. Driver House? Driver House, yeah. So there, you know, it's rented out to basically everybody or anybody that uh, wants to go in there. The, uh, it's 30 units. The total rent is $707, which is 
on the low side. Um, but they're basically in competition with, with private industry. So we've got a number of apartment buildings in town and other rental uh, properties that basically compete with this type of property. If it's subsidized by the taxpayers, um, to me it's kind of a, a conflict. So uh, I, I would like to see us uh, deny the request. Thank you. Councillor Dober. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, just a couple um, things on this. One, they said they rented out for 707. I don't think any private apartment or sector in this community rents anything for that affordable. Um, the other is is they were diligent on which properties they applied for. They didn't apply for all of them. And I think this helps clearly, you know, if there is a bit of profit in there, it's funding their organization and what they do for our community. So I, I'm opposed to the motion. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Your Worship, if I can. Yeah, go ahead, Councilor Rober. I will also be voting against this motion. There's also a difference that those tenants of the facilities that Dawson Creek Society for Community have, have access to in-place living supports, meal programs. These are not offered by private business. And without these facilities, these people would be displaced once again in our community. So I'll be voting against this motion. Thank you. Further discussion? Yeah, I, honestly, I, uh, I I agree. I don't see any uh, difference to me. Or sorry, I agree with the motion. I, I don't see any difference. These are um, a, a, a residents that are being uh, rented out in the marketplace uh, to no specific sector, just to people who uh, have the availability of it. And we made that uh, clearly that distinction with uh, the driver house, with the Bethel uh, apartments where um, they're no different than the Spruce Land Manor or Selwyn Place in my view in terms of how they're operated or who they're rented to. So, Councillor Dober. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I might be missing something, but did, they did say that there is restrictions to rent all their places. Like you have to fit certain criteria. You got to be disabled in our community. Like were the other places? Did they have those requirements to get in? Because I don't think like I can't just go rent there, can I? Or can I? I I don't believe. It was my understanding that the Rotary Village, the uh, this facility is rented to. It doesn't. It's not to that specific. They took this uh, property over from the Rotary Club who operated as a uh, facility that rented to seniors, but it wasn't any specific um, uh, classification like some of the others, in my understanding. Because when I asked her if there was stipulations and regulations about all the places they rented out, she said there was. I think she did differentiate, though, with Rotary Harbor. She said it was the only one that was different, my understanding. And uh, Administration, did you guys have, do you have any understanding? Your Worship, we'd have to look for clarity. As I understood the presentation, it was their rent was based on their income, uh, I believe, that was offset is what I got from that. But um, we would have to follow yeah. up again. Same as Southview, um, where that, but that's a BC housing facility that yeah. they get this, the rent subsidized, the rent paid for, the, for that through BC housing, but or the taxes paid for BC housing. But I understood this was different, on my understanding. Refre refresh me on which building is Rotary? Rotary, Village, Rotary Harbor is the one by uh, Spruce Land Manor, by the Senior Citizens Hall in there. Like right behind Central? Uh, yeah, right yes. across the corner from Central by McKe McKellar Avenue there. Okay. Yeah. And is that the lower ones, like the yeah. one yes. level yeah. Yeah. ones? Okay. Yeah. Councilor Dweckha. Yeah, this uh, Rotary Village used to be operated by Rotary when I was there. And um, the issue with it was the maintenance you know rotary's all volunteers so there were some volunteers like george mcleod that spent tons of time down there you know foundations and all that stuff but the the rental is anybody can go in there and rent if they're low income they get subsidies on their rent but uh and so if they get a subsidy then bc housing tops it up but other than that, I mean, so there's a few people that are probably qualify for low, low income, low rental, 
but not all of them. There's people that go in there that, uh, you know, would be renting somewhere else in town if they didn't go there. But because it's Rotary Village, it's uh, <coughs> typically, you know, the rents are lower in competition with the other apartments. And, I, you know, it's like these people, you know, guys like Doug Scott invested tons of money in these apartments. And, um, you know, if they're competing with, with us because we're subsidizing, you know, facilities like this, <laughs> it's not fair. It, it just isn't fair. So, like, uh, to me, uh, you know, it's it's one of the facilities that we we shouldn't be subsidizing. Thank you, Councillor Dover. I guess just learning more about it, I think I might uh, just have a little bit of change of heart on this. I didn't realize that there was uh, subsidies for those people renting, and then that that it's open to the public market. So, thank you, thank you for clarifying with me, everybody. Further discussion, Your Worship, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. I would just. Dover. I would just like to my colleagues disabilities income through um, social assistance, their rental portion is $500. Now, Mr. Scott and other private owners in this community that own rental properties are not renting places for $500 or $700. And regardless of what facility is, there is criteria in the application to apply for housing for Dawson Creek Society Living. If we do not support the most vulnerable people in our community, that BC housing unit that we just got is not going to be big enough. Now this society was built on inclusion of all people in the community and the few properties that they're asking for tax exemption on are how they support vulnerable people. So they do have criteria and it is on their website. So I'm, I'm opposed and I'm appalled to think that we would not support the most vulnerable people in our community. And I'm telling you, you can't live off $500 a month for rent. Thank you. And that's how it's subsidized. The difference to $707. Thank you. So, um, Councillor Dover. Sorry, last question. What, what is the cost for this one location for the permissive tax? Exemption. Sorry. <laughs> Three or sheep. So the granted for disease two thousand nine hundred ninety six dollars. Two thousand nine hundred dollars. That's what would be the tax grant for based on meal two thousand twenty one meal rate. Thank you. Further discussion, further comments, council. Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? I'm opposed. Thank you. So the motion fails. So I need uh, the. Uh, Councillor Wilbur, Councillor Earl, Councillor Dover voted opposed, and uh, there were three in favor. So I need a motion for the. Uh, Your worship. Yes? Uh, that was the delay again. I was in favor. So you were in favor? Yes. Oh, thank you. So it was the delay. I saw your hand go up. Uh, my apologies. So the motion passes. And opposed was Councillor Wilbur, Councillor Dover. Thank you. Do we need uh, the other four property, the other properties identified then in a motion to approve them, I think, don't we? Yes. Councillor uh, Javekov? Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll move that we uh, approve the other four. Thank you. Second, Councillor Kemp. <laughs> Discussion? Go ahead, Councillor uh, Jubeka. Yeah, so again, I, you know, it, it always amazes me how much we have to offer for social services in this community. You know, when you look at all of the different organizations that have, uh, that provide social services that have presented here, um, <laughs> I don't think we can be complaining about it, that's for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Council. Anything further, Administration? Those deal with those uh, four delegations today. Oh, the Grandview Grand Chapel. Chapel. I'm sorry, we got the last one. My apologies. Delegation number four was the Grandview Chapel. I still think we need to. Are do we the voting board. on the motion? Are so we voting on the motion to approve? Yeah, we one, need to vote on it. The one before you. 
Your Worship, the one on the oh, other I'm properties, sorry. yes. I was happy to be moving along. Um, so the motion on the other four properties has been made and seconded. Uh, further discussion on that, sorry. All those in favor? Opposed? Approved. Carried, thank you. And the fifth one, uh, sorry, the fourth one for item 5.5 .5 is the Granby Chapel. Councillor Jovetko? I'll make a motion that we deny the request. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for the motion? For a second time, do I have a seconder for the motion that we deny the request? Councillor Do Dober? Go ahead, Councillor Javekov. So this is, uh, the property's vacant. It's used as a parking lot. Um, I don't know how much use it has as a parking lot, but uh, I guess, you know, there's other, there, there's other options for parking there. Um, the lot itself with the building on it is, uh, it's a considerable size. There's probably room for parking on there to be developed, but I think uh, vacant lots, I don't think should be subsidized with a tax exemption. Thank you. Councillor Dober? Um, I just second this. Out of respect to Councillor Jubekoff, I just wanted to hear his side. I think if it's, to me personally, if it's just a parking lot that's used and it's not you know, not an investment property or they're not sitting on it to sell it, that I would be opposed to this motion. So. Thank you. Further discussion? Yeah, I think honestly, I, um, uh, we have a number of uh, our churches and places of worship in the community that have additional properties that don't fall within that statutory uh, exclusion uh, for property taxation and I think the aspect that this church uh, utilizes the parking lot or the vacant lot for parking etc um, I just think it's worthwhile for us to consider continuing to have it utilized or have it utilized for the uh, church and that we continue to allow that permissive tax exemption for it until such time as we review that entire topic of uh, places of worship and churches in terms of statutory exclusion and or what we allow. And to me, that's a, that's a broader discussion than picking them off one at a time. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, the motion's defeated. Four to two, it was in favor was Councillor uh, Javakoff and Councillor Kemp. And opposed, I saw Councillor Dober, Earl, Wilbur, and myself. The delay is a little us, <laughs> but I believe that's what it was. Um, so a motion then uh, of what we're going to do. Councillor Dober. I'll make a motion we approve the um, permissive tax exemption for the Grandview Chapel uh, extra lot that's used for parking. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Javakoff. Discussion? All those in favor? In favor. Opposed? That's carried. Thank you, Council and Administration. Uh, that concludes the items that we had to deal with today under our special. Is there any other business? Uh, council, uh, administration? Till the boss and the money uh, decide whether we're good or not. <laughs> we're just gonna, uh, we just got uh, some a conversation going here before we adjourn between you guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just waiting to make sure we haven't missed anything. <laughs> you guys are good? Staff, administration? The council, thank you so much. You guys, Councillor Earl, Councillor Wilbur, thank you for uh, calling in and uh, being here today. We appreciate it. Motion to adjourn. Councillor Dober, Councillor Kemp, all in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Have a great week, everybody.